For our group project, we chose to do the solo growth model. And for our video, what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a brief introduction to what the model is. Then we're going to move into the assumptions the model makes to be accurate. And then we're going to talk about a brief description about what the model is and all of its inner workings. And finally, we're going to talk about some of the short and long run implications to the solo growth model. To start off, here's a bit of background on the solo model. The solo model was created by Robert Solo in 1956 and it won the Nobel Prize in Economics. The solo model is a very simple model of economic growth and that it only focuses on one variable, physical capital per worker. The solo model uses physical capital to describe the differences between countries' output and income per worker. Next, we'll move on to assumptions. In order to make the solo growth model work, we have to assume several things. One, we have to assume that the quantity of labor inputs is the same over time. This means that there is going to be no increase or decrease in the amount of labor input. Also, we have to assume that the production function will not change. Thirdly, we have to assume that there are always going to be diminishing returns to capital and that each additional unit of capital input is going to yield fewer and fewer returns to the solo model. Finally, we have to assume that the economy is always going to move towards the steady state unless there are technological improvements, which means that technological improvements is the only thing that is going to move the solo model further. This graph shows a relationship between K, which stands for capital, on the x-axis, and output on the y-axis. The first thing shown in this graph is the production function. It is increasing at a decreasing rate, meaning that there are diminishing returns of output. The more capital you have, the more output you have. But at a certain point, more capital will only make a small difference in output, as this picture highlights. One problem we have with capital is the problem of depreciation highlighted by the straight depreciation line. Since we are saving a certain fraction of our money to buy capital, we have the savings curve. Because we still want to purchase items, it will only be a small fraction. When you first start getting more capital, moving from a small amount of capital to a high amount, you're becoming better off and moving to the right of this graph. But there's a dilemma of having too much capital. An example for a company that experiences a dilemma is when there's way too much machinery for the amount of people employed to operate this machinery. Another example is a college student having five cell phones because usually it doesn't benefit the student. One is usually enough. At that point, you'll be moving to the left of the graph. Both movements are taking us to the steady state position, highlighted by the graph as the point where depreciation and investment meet. This is also called the equilibrium. As we reach that point, there's no more growth in the solar growth model. This is why we need new technologies, because it's the only way to shift the curve upward in this model. Now we'll move on to the short-run implications of the solo growth model. First, policy measures like tax cuts or subsidies affect the steady state of output, but they won't affect the long-run national curve. Second, growth is affected only in the short run as the economy converges to the new steady state output level. Third, the rate of growth as the economy converges to the steady state is determined by the rate of capital accumulation. Capital accumulation is in turn affected by the savings rate as well as the rate of capital depreciation. Okay, so now we're going to move to the long run implications. So in the solar growth model, the long run rate of growth is exogenously determined. In other words, it is determined outside of the model. A common pr prediction of these models is that an economy will always converge towards a steady state rate of growth, which depends only on the rate of technological progress and the rate of labor force growth. So secondly, a country with a higher saving rate will experience faster growth. For example, Singapore had a 40% saving rate in the period of 1960 to 1996 and an annual GDP, GDP growth rate of 5 to 6%, combined, uh, compared with Kenya in the same period, which had 50% saving rate, annual GDP growth of just 1%. This relationship was anticipated in the earlier models and is retained in the solar growth model. However, in the very, in the very long run, Capital accumulation appears to be less significant than technological innovation in the solar model. This graph right here shows investment as a share of GDP averaged on the x-axis and the real GDP growth averaged on the y-axis. As you can see, 
India and China with about 35 to 45 percent of investment as a share of GDP has a much higher real GDP growth average. If you're looking at India, it's close to 8 percent and China even close to 11 percent compared to the U.S. with an investment as a share of GDP of only around 18 percent is only experiencing about 2% of real GDP growth. 